You are interested in the unknown, the mysterious, the unexplainable. That is why you are here. We are gathered here as advisors, as scientists. The kind of place we expect a ghost to like to walk around. Hey, we all know that we're going to die, baby. I'll help you. I'm something of a witch. Welcome to Mission Spooky. I am your host today, Kiki, the queen of everything. With us today, we have a very special guest. Shanna Stoker. For those of you who might be interested, yeah, well, there's there's a vampire in the room. We'll talk about that in a second. But how are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Hanging in there on the intense <laughs> heat. Yes, this, <laughs> this even up here, it's so hot. Ugh, I'm so ready for fall. <sighs> yeah. Oh yeah. And and of course, I have Cord with me today too. Sorry, buddy. I totally. I'm alive. That. I'm here. <laughs> Hi, Cord. <laughs> I'll wave from the back sheet. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> JC will listen to this later and complain and tell, tell everybody how uh, horrible a host I am because I always forget to introduce the other person. Sorry there, buddy. <laughs> so sorry. Let's get the vampire, as I was saying, out of the room first. Your last name is Joker. <laughs> Who is your famous ancestor? Mary Shelley. I'm just kidding. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That would be interesting. That would be a different thing. <laughs> I would love that. So I am related to <laughs> Bram Stoker, who wrote Dracula. And I was going to say that's also my other thing is that uh, my mother's maiden name is Price. And I always joke that it would be great if I was also related to Vincent Price, although I don't have any claim for that one. <laughs> wow. Right. That would just be like the kicker. Whoa. I mean. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> You are a business owner. You sing. We have a lot to talk about. But the <laughs> first thing is this amazing terror tarot deck. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> I'm proud of it. I am not a tarot user, but I was even saying to Cord when I was showing him on your Etsy site, I was like, you've got to see this. If I was ever going to dart tarot, I would buy your deck like in a heartbeat. <laughs> oh, thank you. That means a lot to hear. Thank you so much. And I'm I'm dead serious. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite card is the death card. And previous, I don't think we were recording yet, but you we were talking about wanting some of that New England, the headless <sighs> horseman. As the F card. State New York, yeah. Heck yeah, that is my boy. I love the Headless Horseman. Me too. Did you ever get to go to the cemetery there at all? I've never been, up there? been there. I've oh. never been there and I've never even been to Salem. And let me tell you, I have a history degree and I have been obsessed with the Salem witch trial since I was in fourth grade. And I am dying, dying to get up to Salem and to Sleepy Hollow, but mainly Salem. It's, oh. What? I'm telling you, I need to just take a trip up there. At all. I've been to both, and mm. one of my degrees is in archaeology. So there's <gasps> another. <laughs> Look at there. I almost went into anthropology or archaeology. And then I was thinking, well, maybe I'll teach. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, and so nah. I, decided, I decided history instead because like, I could I could easily translate that into a teaching degree. But yeah, um, archaeology and anthropology, too, are just so fascinating. Salem, a lot of fun, obviously. And we did, we got to do sleepy hollow on halloween night and Ooh. take yeah take the, the cemetery tour on halloween your birthday night. right yes Ooh. thank you for thank you yes it is my birthday. <laughs> yes everybody knows it by october is all i talk about from the day i'm like I, I pretty much actually the last day of september i'm just like it's my birthday this whole month now that's how i am in march for my birthday because yeah. my birthday is march so it's like the whole month is my birthday heck yeah <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it should be. So I was going to ask you if there was a haunted location that you wanted to go to, but hadn't been to yet. So many. Right? Oh my gosh, so many. So I have like no plans or anything, but I'm, I've got this like dream of doing paranormal investigations. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've done a few very low key ones, but like 
I, and when I say that, I mean very much in the spirit of like kindred spirits. I'm not talking Zach Baggins, which like fine if you like him and everything, but he's not my uh, my type of energy. <laughs> right, whereas, right there yeah, with you. Uh, yeah, whereas like kindred spirits goes in and they have much more respect for the spirits that they're speaking to. And it just seems much more genuine. My best friend of nine years and my current roommate, same person. They also experience the paranormal and we have experienced a lot of things together and yeah I would absolutely love to do something like that and just travel like take you know a few months and travel to some really haunted locations I really want to go to the sanatorium in Kentucky it was a tuberculosis hospital is it Waverly Hills yes in Louisville yes yep mm-hmm. got family in Kentucky and we talked we've talked about going there since I was about 10 but we've never been able to um, I would love to go there and I really want to visit Lizzie Borden's house. Yeah. I don't know. I saw both of those. I've known about Waverly Hills for a long time, but I saw the Liz- Lizzie Borden house on um, Kindred Spirits, actually. And it was a really interesting investigation. And she seems like she would be fun to interact with, you know, fun relatively <laughs> to interact with. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, like she doesn't like to be called Lizzie Borden. She likes to be called by the name that she took after all of that scandal. And anyway, it's just there's yeah, there's so many places I want to visit. Oh, I just love ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. Like I find so much comfort in <laughs> the supernatural and stuff like that, which I used to be so afraid of. And now I'm just like, oh, I love it. It makes me happy. When exactly did you kind of get that spark? or the paranormal? Were you young? I was. Whole life, I have always kind of really been into it. It's it's funny. My mom said that, for example, my mom said that before I could talk, I was I was singing along, um, obviously not lyrics, but I was like singing along with Nightmare Before Christmas, like kidnap the Sandy Claus. And I'm like, and so I've always kind of been into weird stuff, which is very strange because my mother is absolutely not except for she loves true crime and I'm the opposite I don't like true crime that that stuff actually scares me the paranormal doesn't scare me right because those people are legit crazy yeah and they're like yeah no it's different that's totally different but yeah I've always been into the weird and creepy and macabre and paranormal but I first know I'd had experiences before I was eight but the first experience I can actually recall vividly was when I was eight we had just moved into a new home and the bedroom that, well, what, what, what became my bedroom was actually kind of like a, it had been a study and it was also kind of a hallway. I don't want to sound like, but like you had to go through this room to get from one part of the house to the other part of the house. There was no other way to get around. So like I had a bunch of doorways and then a lot of area that just wasn't, it was just doorways. Like I could just see into the laundry room or into the living room or whatever. And there was one night, my bed was parallel to the door that entered into the laundry room. And that was also the side of the house that my sister's room was on. So from her room into the laundry room and into the bathroom was this pathway. And I was laying there one night on my side and I was just kind of thinking about a bunch of different stuff. And I started feeling like really creepy and eerie. And so I like, I pulled my covers up and then all of a sudden I saw this cat. It was like, we had this like ghost cat that I remember seeing a bunch, but this, it, this cat came through from my sister's room and into my room then the living room through, you know, out through the other door of the living room. And then right after him, there was a Native American man who walked in doorway in front of the laundry. He stopped and he looked at me. And then he looked forward and he walked into the bathroom. But that's like, it was moving towards the water because I, li- I lived right on the, the Mobile Bay in Alabama. So he was headed towards the where the water would have been. And it was just so interesting because he looked right at me and I just remember feeling so comforted by him. I was obviously scared because I'm eight and I just saw something I know is not a real person. It was the strangest thing, but I'll never forget that. It was, it's still so vivid today. I know so many people who have seen the Native American spirits and stuff. That's something that I've never actually seen myself. Mm So I'm very interested in it. It is. It's really interesting. And it's just, it is, I've ever since that night, I've always wondered what that area would have looked like or what, you know, who lived there. And it's just, it's, it's so, it's honestly so sad. But felt that, I don't know. I don't know why he was there. I don't know why offered me comfort but he was so kind it just felt so kind i just remember being really really young and it took me you had talked about earlier 
like the imposter syndrome issue where we're yeah. like, you know, oh, we must be crazy. We we must be yes. seeing things. My first experience was there was always this man who was looking over me all the time when I was mm. really little. And the same thing, you felt like comfort and almost like just checking in on me. And I was <sighs> 30 years old when I discovered who this person was. And it was my great grandfather who I had never met before in my entire life. Oh my God. I had a cousin. Uh, well, he's technically my cousin, but he's much, much older than me. He's uh, about the same age as my mom, like their first cousins, basically. And long after my great grandmother had passed away, um, he got in touch and, and sent all these really cool photographs of them. And there's a, a picture of, of them being married. They got married in England. And. Oh it was him and I'm staring at this picture like oh my god that's that's the guy <laughs> like that's who was always looking in on me that's so cool like mm. only when I was a child it's you know he I feel like maybe he just kind of peeked in wanted to see the new the newcomer and then when I as I got older I didn't really see him much anymore if at all so you could be absolutely right that he was just doing it then. But there, I think there's also that bit of us that's, you know, as we get older, it's harder to see them. And that's something I've had to work on personally is like, I noticed I would get scared or I would get so bogged down with other things in my life that I kind of closed that part of me off. And the more that I work with it, it's like becoming easier again to just experience them when they want to be experienced. And I think that's, that's just something that children don't have as many hangups on, you know, like you don't have as much going on that's taking you from that state of mind and that openness. And I think that we just lose that as adults. It's just something that we tend to grow out of a lot of times, right? Like getting so bogged down in, in everyday stuff mm -hmm. that you just let it you let it go. I listened to your interview on another podcast. You had talked about that too, about um, honing your skill and mm. that you had closed, had to learn how to close yourself off to it. So you're not constantly, you know, bombarded by this. Mm -hmm. That really struck a chord with me too, because I was like, <laughs> struck a chord. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry. Couldn't let it go. Today, huh? We got jokes. I get it. <laughs> JC's not here. Somebody has to do the dumb jokes. <laughs> but, uh, it stayed with me because it was kind of the opposite. I had a very like supportive grandmother who was also a witch and mm. read tarot and was in a paranormal investigative team and tried to find missing children using her clairvoyance. I mean, you name it, mm. she was involved in it. And I learned from an early age how to close myself off so that when I got older, I realized I've been closed off from this like inadvertently for too long. Mm -hmm. That's what happened to me when I tried to learn how to close it. I then like felt like I couldn't balance it. Yeah. Right? Like you had to like choose whether you wanted it closed or open for like a long period of time. Because if you go back and forth, you drive yourself crazy. Yep. Got to learn that balance. Like it's not just either or the ego self or the spiritual self. It's work together. And maybe one will take a little bit of a back seat sometimes, like if you're focused on like spiritual work or trying to speak with somebody um, from the beyond. <laughs> right. But, you know, and like maybe when I'm at work uh, and I'm doing more practical things, my ego self will take the front seat. But it's just it's all about finding that balance. And I mean, that's a constant journey. I think it's still something I struggle with that I hope to one day find the right groove but yeah it's it's a it's a hard struggle do you find that you still struggle with it it's really strange I was actually talking to Cord a little bit about this um, earlier is like I haven't had many experiences with the paranormal and like for a long long time mm -hmm. I just wasn't really in, in a place where anybody was showing up I wasn't feeling anything you know whatever yeah. my husband's mother passed away five years ago now and unfortunately my son he never knew knew her she got to meet him and she passed away like uh, three months after he was born we were just in north carolina visiting that house and now i have never felt anything at all since she passed away i felt it was a very clean break for her like mm -hmm. she had a lot of issues and she was just gone you know she's like i'm i'm out of here and i thought good you know that's maybe the way yeah it should be for her. There was not much else for her here on this plane. Like she was done, but she's a trickster. 
She's a very tricksy lady and she liked to play little games with people. And after five years of not feeling her at all, I was not asleep yet. I was still very much like awake and my son was sleeping next to me. And damn, if she did not enter the room and grab my arm, a full on Mm. grab, which never happened to me before in the history of me ever doing any kind of (laughs) investigating or anything. I jumped. I literally jumped and I. I, my my husband's asleep in the room too, but he was a cro- like he's in the bed across from us. I'm surprised I didn't wake him up because I literally jumped on and I was like, "Damn!" It. Like, "Mom, stop it! <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why would you do that to me? You just scared the." Oh my sh- god, that's amazing. I woke up like the kid was sound asleep. My husband was out cold. I was like, "Yep, okay. Well, this is why." <laughs> This is why Kiki keeps herself closed off a lot because, you know. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's just really inconvenient. Yeah, I don't want to be touched either. I cannot tell you how many times it's just sitting, working or whatever, and I'll hear my name from another room or I will feel the bed shake or I'll get tapped because I'm finding that balance and I'm not scared anymore from it. I'm really not. I'm now just like, well, hello, friend, you know, <laughs> just letting you, just reminding you, just positive energy right? here. Uh, if you need to contact me, please do so at the following address. No, I mean, um, there's my no, email. Just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's more of just like, you know, I've got like a chair in my room and it's really cozy and I'm just like, you know, have a seat, take a load off. It's nice to have you, but just reminding you only positive things in this room. So <laughs> I just try to set those boundaries again every time that I feel like a new presence or a new tap or a, you know, or anything. Or just like, even if it's not necessarily new, but they're joining me again, I just try to be very outspoken and not forceful, but with conviction, state what the boundaries are for my energy and the energy of my face. Absolutely. About the closing yourself thing. Mm-hmm. I had an extremely similar circumstance because I went to school for massage therapy. Mm. Part of that was doing energy work. Mm -hmm. We would do sessions where we would do quote unquote massages where we wouldn't touch the body. Like we did a lot of like Reiki. Yeah. I wanted to get into Reiki specifically. I think it's fascinating. But during that time, we had some really bizarre stuff happen. Like there were people like leaving the room, like crying and some emotions came out. Mm -hmm. When I was done with school, me and my friends got into amateur, quote unquote, paranormal investigating. Mm -hmm. We were going through abandoned houses, not necessarily with anyone's permission. It was it was dumb. And I was using a lot of energy work methods to like get into the zone and stuff. And a lot of things started following me or becoming more yep. stronger and I had to close myself off to it. Yeah. Sometimes you do. You have to make like a hard choice there. It, I went years, like many, many, many years of going just like, nope, I'm not going with you guys. I'm not doing this. And when I decided to like actually calm down about it, it like came back to me with a really big force, I guess I should say. Like mm-hmm. things just like came straight back. <laughs> I opened yeah. up again. They're just like, hey, we're still here, by the way. <laughs> it's just like, oh no. That's kind of what I mean. Like when I was saying earlier that I don't think necessarily it's that we're being visited less by spirits. Now I'm not that's not to say, you know, by your specific spirit that you were talking about, um, Kiki, but I think it's more so that we just we lose that ability. We lose that muscle. We lose that connection to our spiritual selves and to that plane of existence. And that's like the thing is like when you turn it back on, it's like, oh, we never left. We've been here. Yeah. You, you just haven't been able to to see us or hear us or, or interact. Yeah. The things that made me start paying attention to it again is people started getting real weird at my parents' house when I still live there. And I was just like, mm. huh, now that you notice it, now that you like say something about it. And I started paying attention to it again. And then it started like visiting me every single night. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh my god, I've had that happen too. What did you do? Uh, I moved out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised it didn't follow you. I thought it was going to. Most of my, I'm, I'm also at least to some extent skeptic. But the thing that always hits me is I get sleep paralysis a lot. Things visit me mm. during sleep paralysis, and I was getting visited almost daily by a very, very angry thing during my sleep paralysis. Mm. As soon as I moved out of the house, I had it like one more time 
And then now it's like very sparsely. So I don't really have sleep paralysis anymore too much. So I guess it doesn't have a way to come after me anymore. Wow. That's really interesting. It was not good. I was actually getting ready to go to like see somebody because I thought I was going crazy. (laughs) I thought I was losing it. (laughs) I get it. Like sleep paralysis every day is not fun. I've never experienced sleep paralysis. And that is one thing that like I I was talking about, I find comfort and like, there's a difference between feeling a spirit and feeling like maybe a ghost and then feeling like poltergeist or or a negative entity like there are those out there and those do not provide comfort no matter how much you wish they would and so like i'm terrified of getting a sleep paralysis it is absolutely terrifying to me so i'm so sorry you've been through that i have so many people that are super interested in it because they haven't been through Mm. sleep paralysis and they want me to like either my one friend's mom suggested i keep a dream journal and like somebody else suggested that i draw the things that i see when i'm Mm -hmm. in sleep paralysis stuff but then i keep thinking back i believe it was tim renner told me like the more you like make an entity concrete the more hold it could possibly have on you that, that might become a huge problem if you do that. So I was like, nope, I'm not doing a dream journal. I'm not doing any of this stuff. Well, and to me, that's just another form of manifestation. It's just putting your, even if you don't mean to, you are putting your thoughts and your intention on this entity. And absolutely, that gives, that that puts that energy out there, right? I mean, that puts that into the universe. And like, I fully believe in manifestation. I believe that you can manifest good things for yourself just as well as you can manifest negative things for yourself, all depending on state of mind and and, in your manifestation skills. But like, I think that's another part of it is, is, you know, one of the reasons why entities can garner such energy from, from just being spoken about or thought about so much is that alone, especially when you're afraid of them. Cause that's a very big energy. Cause the, the thing that was visiting me, I figured out what its name even was. And like, I won't, Mm. I won't, I won't even say its name like on, Mm -mm on recording or anything i won't that's a smart idea i refer to it as the entity i know what it's called i won't say the name Mm -hmm. smart yeah there's my little story that's it (laughs) (laughs) oh yeah it's kind of funny me you jc we've all had these experiences but we actually haven't talked about our own stuff on the podcast yeah i had that i had that one episode where i was a quote-unquote guest before i was on the show (laughs) Before he became a co-host, yeah. We're like, yeah, we definitely have to keep going into this story because this is super interesting. And then we never talked about it again. <laughs> <laughs> Leave that on JC. It's his fault. Uh, <laughs> he's supposed to be directing you. Wow. Yeah. We'll just blame him because he's not here. It's it's easy. <laughs> they can listen to this later and we'll he'll be like, thanks for throwing me under the bus, guys. <laughs> 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 you got run over by the paranormal bus, JC. It definitely isn't the first time. Would, right? that, would that be the mystery machine? Yes! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's the off-brand version. The paranormal bus. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a t-shirt that needs to happen. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Have you ever been to a haunted location that you would consider to be your favorite so far? Yes. <laughs> My favorite experience I've had so far. It's the most solid experience I've had. My uncle, who's a paranormal investigator, took me and my best friend, actually. And it's Spring Villa, Columbus, Georgia. And it, I believe, used to be a plantation. So, yeah, dark. There are two structures there. There's the main house, and then there was, like, um, a serpent's quarter with the kitchens below. And there was a breezeway. And... So we get there and we, you know, we find out that it also used to be Native American land. And which is funny because we found that out after I was like, do you hear drums coming from the trees? Because I hear drums coming from the trees. And I just thought maybe it was, you know, a group or something. And my uncle's like, yeah, that's a common occurrence, evidently. (laughs) And so, (laughs) so, you know, as soon as we got out of the car, I was hearing drums. So like, I thought there might, there must be like a house or a part, like, I don't know. I didn't know what's going on. I didn't know where I was. I was in the middle of nowhere. It was like 12 o'clock at night. We just decided on a wild hair to drive over there from Auburn, Alabama. And it was great. So we get out of the car, I hear drums and he doesn't tell us anything until we ask. Like, I don't know anything about this place going into it, but I am immediately drawn to the kitchen side of the house or that servant side of the house and this tree out front. And I see a little boy and a little girl, a little white girl and a little black boy playing in the, under the tree. 
there's like a swing. They're playing around the tree. And Marcus had said the same thing um, after I mentioned it because like I said we both see a lot of the same stuff. And then later I saw them playing in front of this little the, or this the second smaller structure. And then after that I saw the little girl in the window of that second smaller structure, and she looked so sad. She was just looking out at me, and creeped me out. I'll tell you that much. But um, but yeah, she just looked really sad, and. So then I'm like, okay, so I go and so I feel drawn to the breezeway. So I go over there. We've all separated at this point. They're all, you know, we're all doing our separate things. So I'm over at the breezeway and I'm looking out, you know, just kind of looking out and seeing what I sense. As I'm turning around, I kind of am facing the road where the road is now. And I see these two very thin, like wheel tracks from like a carriage that went from the breezeway kind of like where the tree was not directly at the breezeway but right in front of that area and went straight across the field in front of the house over where the road was now and down another path that I believe must have been another like what their road looked like before maybe a long driveway I don't know but I could tell very clearly it was wagon wheel marks or or some type of carriage wheel marks after seeing that I was like okay I'm Obviously, I'm picking stuff up. I just, I'm just going to, I was, I was, like I said, I was at, this was when I was at Auburn and I was really learning how to open and close the door. And so I had already decided to open it, but I really was still kind of holding back and I could tell. So I sat down on the breezeway with my feet on the steps because it was an elevated platform. And I just kind of relaxed and got into kind of a meditative pose. And I just started breathing and saying outwardly, quietly, I am open to hearing your message. I am open to feeling what you want me to feel. I only allow positive energy to cling to me and that kind of thing, basically. Like, you can't come home with me, but you can tell me what you're feeling. (laughs) I sat there for a moment, and very soon after that, I felt so distinctly a hand on my shoulder. And my eyes were closed. I knew it wasn't Marcus or my uncle. I knew it. I didn't open my eyes. I immediately started to sob. Just uncontrollably sobbing and saying, I am so sorry. And I look up, I still close, but in the space within that, I look up and I see this black woman. She looks like she worked in the kitchen and she's got an apron on and a rag around her head. And there are tears rolling down her face, but she also, she just had such a kind expression and I don't understand that. I still... Do not understand that because she had been through so much and felt like that little boy had passed away. And I don't know if it was her son. I I felt like it was her son. He had died as a little boy. I just kept sobbing and, and apologizing and feeling shame and feeling sorrow for her. And she just looked at me. She just had her her hand on my shoulder and she said, he's better. He's okay now. He's in a better place and he's doing well. I'm okay. I don't know why. I don't know why this happened. I don't know why she would come to me. I don't know why. I'm so grateful because it was just so beautiful and so vivid and so real. And she was just right there, hand on my shoulder. It was beautiful, but it was so sad. That experience has just, I mean, it still gives me chills. It's just the most concrete experience I've ever had. Yeah, I'm not uh, I'm not crying. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, that is powerful. That is very powerful. I, I never actually had any kind, anything even remotely like that. That's amazing. When you talk about being able to see, how does that, like, how does that work for you? Do you feel like you actually see it or is it more like you're seeing it in your mind's eye? Yes, mind's eye. So there's two different ways that I see things. When I have my eyes closed, it's like, This blackness, this darkness, right? You've got your eyes closed, but then there's this very vivid, clear image within it. Almost like within a dream where sometimes you can look from yourself and sometimes you can look at yourself. You know, it was kind of like that because that happened multiple times during this experience with her was like I was looking up at her and then I was looking at both of us and then I was looking up at her again. And it was just so interesting. So there's that type of seeing that happened that night. And then there is the more like, as clear, 
the experiences that I've talked about before where like I'll see imprints of the past or I'll see sometimes they're entities, but usually it's more of like an imprint of the past, like a very residual energy. I'll see structures or people or whatever. And that's more like, so my eyes are open and it comes off. It's like in my mind's eye, like a projection onto the space. I know I can't touch it. I know it's not there. Um, it's, it's like a shimmery golden light. It's almost like when the heat comes off the pavement and everything's kind of like, you know what I mean? It gets kind of wiggly. Mm. Yeah. Like that, but it's golden. And that's where the shimmer comes from is this like movement that it has. And I can see through it, but it has an energy and it has a light. So that's the two different ways that I experience kind of seeing those things. And when I like hear things, I have two different ways of hearing things as well, which is like when I hear you know, I'll hear spirits or something like calling my name from the other room in the house that I know nobody's in or something like that, you know, that feels very much like it's in the space around me. Like if you were with me, you could hear that. But then there's other ways where that I, I might hear things in my mind, like a, like the same way you might hear your thoughts or the same way you can sing a, a song in your head and you can clearly hear it, but you're not literally hearing it. You know, it's it's that kind of thing. That's been really hard for me to, to, I've struggled a lot with that because I'm, I'm like, how do you know for sure it's not just your own thoughts? But they don't come to me like thoughts. They don't sound or feel like thoughts. It's something I'm hearing and it's very interesting the way that happens. Yeah, I have a really difficult time trying to explain that to people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like I am not literally hearing a voice in my head psychometry have you ever had that happen to you where you're able to pick something up and actually get information like from a physical object yes yes so yeah i love to go to thrift stores and do that right (laughs) okay so like and yeah i worked in an archives once where that was a i had a good time there so (laughs) i love it this is something that i found out that i i had the other thing Mm -hmm. too is being is um it's not on all the time so I say the biggest thing that I had happen is when my husband's father passed away. We had only been married for six months and then we had this, he passed away and we had, we inherited everything that he had, all of his mm. antiques and everything. Um, a lot of really cool family heirlooms, but I didn't know that because a lot of this was in storage and it wasn't in his apartment. So this was us also having to clean out the apartment and his storage unit. We bring everything back to our place little by little. My husband comes home from work one day and I have this bookcase set up and I have all of this stuff and I can't. Yeah, this is the part that when I try to explain to people, the information just comes in a wave of it's not a voice. I just know that it. Their cognizance. Yeah. That you mentioned before. It's just yeah. like it's totally different than like that voice. Yeah. He comes home and is completely and utterly free. He he believed me that I have special whatever you want to call it, right? Because he doesn't want to, yeah. you know, he, he, but he'd never seen anything like this. He's like, why did you put that clock there? I'm like, because that in your, uh, it, because it belongs there. It just yeah. does. I don't know what to tell you, but it, it belongs there. That one belongs in there because that one's older. This one though, he's telling me to get rid of it. And, he, and he's like, wait, who's um. telling you? And I'm like, uh, I'm assuming this is your father because I don't know. I mean, I, every, everything that I put everywhere in that house was exactly, there were things he showed me pictures later that I, I didn't have access to. He was like, do you see where you put that effing clock? You put it inside, (laughs) you put it inside my grandmother's bookcase from England that we didn't even have. How did you know that it went in there in this picture? Mm. This is how she used to have it set up. You didn't in, in Virginia, in a, in a house that you've never been in before. (laughs) I was like, I don't know. I just. It was the craziest thing, but it, it was tiring. It was literally like by the end of the day, I like, I can't, I can't do any more. Mm-hmm. I need a break. Mm-hmm. That's the part where people will be like, are you sure that you're not either hearing things or that you're just really good at guessing where things go? That's How- yes. Like no. I've told myself for so long, you're just really good at guessing. You're right? just like, you know, <laughs> you're just, you know, you're making really astute observations. <laughs> I'm Sherlock Holmes then. Okay. Is that what you're saying? Because that's awesome too. (laughs) I'll take that. But I mean, I'll be a genius fine, but like, right. um, Pretty sure I'm not. (laughs) Yeah. 
I even had books, the book, the bookcase. I had the books in the right place. The clock. I found like these, a a pair of glasses that belonged to his great, great grandfather. Mm -hmm. I put them inside the bookcase next to this little pipe. And he was just like, why? How did you know that? That's, that is, that those were two of his things. Like that's my great grandfather's stuff. And you're putting it next to the clock inside the family. I, I'm, he was, he freaked out. He literally was like, I can't be around you right now. You're, you're scaring me. (laughs) Oh, I don't know, man. I'm really sorry, buddy. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I have not had that kind of intense, like the intensity of it again for a while. But but again, you talk about like, well, closing yourself off. Well, geez, we had we we lost his grandmother, then his father, like within a two week span. We had just gotten married. He was changing jobs. It just seemed to be like I got everything at once and then nothing for years. Like I just... You know? I think it happens like that because, you know, everything has a season. And I think that goes with our spiritual gifts as well, you know, and I do think that you can absolutely keep that going throughout, right? You can, you have power over that. But if you're just kind of going with the flow of your own energy and the own, you know, your own seasons, as it were, then yeah, sometimes that's what happens. And I don't know particularly that it's, a, you know, the same reason for every person. I doubt that it is. I think it is very much certain events or lack thereof that really have such an influence over our gifts and our abilities to perceive them. I consider myself a garbage witch because I just kind of pick sometimes. (laughs) I've never never heard that before and I kind of love that. I love it so much. (laughs) I'm like, oh, look at that cool thing sitting on the side of the road. I think Odin would appreciate that. I'm just going to grab it and stick it on my altar. I don't know why. It's just, it's calling to me. Garbage witch. That's my favorite thing in the world now. Use it, please. (laughs) Do it. I mean, I don't know that I'd call myself a garbage witch. And I don't know that I should ever call another witch a garbage witch or garbage witch who's not identifying as that personally. Um, But I do think it's fabulous. Right. It could be taken wrong. It could be taken the wrong way. Oh, goodness. Especially, and I know that you've touched on this before, the gatekeeping in the community yeah. sucks. So, <laughs> yeah. Every community has gatekeepers. Yes. Because every community, especially of of these like niche communities, is filled with people who have felt so much like outcasts for so long that they finally have something that is theirs and they feel very strongly about it. I understand what leads to gatekeeping. I just think it's the wrong way to respond to that sort of trauma that we've been through, you know? Right. So do you, do you kind of identify with... Like, are you a garden witch? Are you a kitchen witch, hedge witch? Or are you yes. just, you're like, yes, all of I it. I would have to be. Yeah, honestly, like like my my favorite way to describe myself, not just in my witchcraft, but like in everything about me is I'm eclectic. Um, So the, the term eclectic witch is very, that just has always felt right for me because I'm very much a person who like, I don't believe in boxing yourself in. I don't believe that you need labels. However, I understand that labels really help guide and bring comfort for people. For example, I've recently, like in the past two years, been diagnosed with ADHD. That is a label that has truly helped me better understand myself. So I fully understand that they can be useful. However, with my witchcraft, it is something that is so ever evolving and changing. And I love to just learn and take things from so many different forms of the craft that I feel like if I if I give myself a label, then I am going to box myself in, even if I don't realize it. So eclectic, I guess, is the only label I would <laughs> give to myself. That way it leaves it kind of open-ended, you know? <laughs> I, I went there, except I went all the way to the, the trash bin. So <laughs> myself, <laughs> for myself, for myself. <laughs> It just, it just it literally did remind me of like oh look at that sofa on the side of the road i, I god i wanted to do a, a silly tiktok video about it too and be like wow look at that rock like i need to take that home and just put that on the altar i don't know why it's just really cool oh, that look, boulder look. that's a nice boulder that's right <laughs> <laughs> that's literally like what it's like to be a witch <laughs> Yeah, there's a pine cone. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And that's the thing too about like my belief system is very much based on just listening to the energies of nature around you. And yeah, maybe that pine cone wants to be a part of your household, you know? <laughs> no, you don't know. Uh, feel you. Okay, so we're going to take just a, a quick break for our musical guest or our featured music. And hey, you might 
you might know who this band is, Vision Video. I have not had the pleasure. Ah, you got to check him out. So Dusty's also known as Goth Dad on TikTok. He's hysterical. (laughs) I absolutely love this guy. Looking him up right now. Yeah. And um, his music is amazing. He it's just takes me back to like old school goth. Oh, we already follow each other, I think. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> right. I don't know if he follows me, but I definitely follow him. Yep. Goth dad. He's the lead singer for Vision Video. <laughs> Very cool. Just kind of happened. Right. Yeah. No, I definitely follow him. That's really cool. OK, so today's song is from Vision Video and it is called Comfort in the Grave. And that is on their new album called Inked in Red. And you can find that on Bandcamp. And we always have the link in the show notes. And when we get back, we're going to talk to Shanna about her Etsy store, which is amazing. Everybody. (laughs) Such a nerd. (laughs) (laughs) Probably the least nerdy out of the three co-hosts here. All right. Probably true. So before we get into your amazing Etsy store, because I want you to go and just hear the end here about the process because holy crap these cards are amazing thank you did you say that you that you played dungeons and dragons is that yes that well i really it's pathfinder <laughs> but yeah <I> know. <laughs> but yeah but yes i count I mean, i've yeah. played i've played dnd too but yeah um i've got more experience with pathfinder but i feel like because it's a much more complex role system that um it's kind of like inclusive of okay i know pathfinder i know dnd yeah oh yeah <laughs> Yeah. I was a Pathfinder boy all the way up until like the beginning of last year when I was like, oh, fifth edition is so much easier. Fuck this. <laughs> seriously, though. <laughs> seriously. It's ridiculous. Oh, now my Siri is on. Okay. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> but really, though, Pathfinder is so, it's so, oh gosh. I'm, I do, I'm looking forward to trying to find a, a D&D like, or a fifth edition game that um, might be a little less complicated you know (laughs) (laughs) all right so just keep that in the back of your head because we do we do have a a ttrpg segment that we do called cord versus cryptid so process of making your designs for your tarot cards how long does that take exactly so it's just my business partner and i and then we use an artist that we subcontract in because neither my business partner and i or i can actually put what we have in our head onto paper i wish i could (laughs) gotcha so yeah, so the entire process per card can take any way, anywhere between two to four weeks usually. We take about 10 to 25 hours just designing. So that's my partner and I looking at the card, trying to figure out what figure we want to be as the main you know, focus of the card. Because our Tarot Tarot deck, for example, all of the figures are based off of Halloween, um, like literary horror characters such as Dr. Frankenstein, Dracula, of course. But we've also tied in just other sort of like, I guess, cryptids or, or just spooky characters that we've created like there's a siren who is the star um there is a spooky marionette in a decrepit old theater that is the hanged man like he's kind of tied up in his in his marionette strings so it's all very very creative and we try to look we try to choose our figures based on the meaning of the card itself and like how can we tie it in we don't want just something that would look aesthetically correct but like their story works as well. Yeah, it takes a while. It takes a lot of research, a lot of research into the lore, into the tarot card in question, that, because we usually try to base it off the Rider Swift weight deck. And we want to make sure that, they, that these designs are 100% our vision because we use another artist, right? So if it, it's just, it's not our design if he's taking liberties, right? If we're not telling him we want the hair color to look like this, we want her toe to be pointed like this, we want the archway just like this and the cobblestones like this, then, you know, it doesn't feel as though that's really our art. So every tiny detail onto the color of the petals on the flowers is determined by us. So after we do all of that designing, then I write up very, like I said, very specific notes for our artist displaying, you know, lining up every single thing that we want. He sends us a sketch after about a week and then we revise the sketch send him our notes he sends us a final with all of the color and shading we revise that one more time and then we get our actual final which goes on all of our merch and and eventually is added to the tarot deck so it's a long process but that's why i feel like i'm just so so immensely proud of them and why the response has been so overwhelmingly positive positive. and this deck that is available is the Major Arcana? Yes. So this is the Terror Tarot deck, Major Arcana. It's the Major Arcana deck only because when we started this, we had no idea we were going to actually make a deck. 
<laughs> we just thought we were going to make some designs, put them on t-shirts, maybe a tapestry, see if people like them. And um, by the time we got finished with the Major Arcana, people were begging for the deck. And we knew it would be years before we could even think about getting started on the Minor Arcana just because of how detailed our design process is and how long it takes. So we wanted to go ahead and get that out. We decided to just go ahead and release the Major Arcana deck. And then we got started on our Shadow Edition of the deck, which is a black and white version that just came out. It's the same deck, all the same designs, but black and white with a silver edging, whereas the original deck that is in color has a matte black edging. They are borderless cards. They have a rose petal matte touch finish, so they really feel like luxurious. And we're also working now on new goddess designs for the Major Arcana that we will release as another Major Arcana deck. Then we're going to go back to the Terror Tarot and, and work on the Minor Arcana. So it's kind of, a, it's a long process. We're a few years away from that, but we're looking forward to it. It's going to be fun. I'm really excited actually for this next edition because you had said the goddesses in it mm -hmm. were going to be very uh, eclectic. It was going to be like all over, very inclusive. Yes, I, well, and that's because again, I'm very eclectic in my beliefs and in my, in my uh, witchcraft. And I have so many friends who worship so many different deities. And while I don't particularly work with uh, any deities, I do have a massive respect for their belief systems and for, you know, what they offer to people. And so for instance, you know, we do have a lot of Norse and Celtic and Greek goddesses. Um, we've got Freya and Hecate and um, Rhiannon. And we just finished her and Diana. That's gorgeous. Athena. But we also have Isis from you know, Egyptian mythology. We also Heck have, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we also have Kali. I absolutely loved oh. researching Kali. And, um, oh, Yamaya from the Yoruba culture. She's amazing. She's our temperance in that one. Oh, she's gorgeous. So yeah, we're trying, We I try to be as inclusive as I can be while also understanding that like most of our audience is typically going to want the Norse or Celtic or Greek goddesses because it's just what's most popular. So they do take up most of the deck, but I still wanted to include other cultures in the deck as well because I just think that's so important to broaden your mind and broaden your scope to what other cultures do for witchcraft as well. Fantastic. And that your Etsy store is called? The Ghoulish Garb. Yes. I love your sticker packs as well very <laughs> thank you very affordable if if you don't you know if you're you like the t-shirt you like the designs but maybe like me i don't really use tarot but i love the designs <sighs> there's and there is another you know way that i could go although honestly i'm definitely getting the headless horseman on a t-shirt <laughs> yes <laughs> i love that one your morrigan poster mm. is also amazing that the absolutely beautiful design which i was like ooh, that would really look nice behind me. you told me you were a scorpio i was like okay she's gonna like our death cards <laughs> <laughs> and i specifically was picturing morrigan for you so i'm glad that you like it Oh, it's beautiful. And the colors are amazing. Those are some of my favorite colors. But that's another thing with the goddess deck is like the colors are insane. Our artist, like we told him we wanted it to be softer than our terror tarot deck. And we wanted there's we added a glow effect to every <gasps> single design. So every single one of the goddesses has some sort of glow effect. It's either the fire or maybe um, some magic swirling from from the book or, you know, there's something in there that has that glow effect in every card. And it is so stunning they are just oh i couldn't be happier <laughs> i can't wait well thank you so much for coming on the show it has been amazing talking to you me. you are welcome again anytime that you want to talk about anything and of course we'd love to have you back on especially when the new deck is ready to go yes, which might not be that. for a little while when <laughs> but i don't care we'll have you back before then we're hoping to have that uh, the goddess done. Hopefully, the, the goddess deck finished by next the end of next year. Like that's that's kind of a lofty plan, but I mean at the same time we're we're on a roll right now. So hopefully that will happen. Yeah, hopefully next year by this time. Stay spooky and don't die. But if you do, contact us. Do a three card spread for me and tell me what it says. Yeah.